tonight we're going to be uh, busting into Romans chapter 14 where we talk about the concepts of personal freedom that we have in Christ to do what we want to do and how that's balanced by this concept of the law of love. Or to put it differently, how do moral ethics work when you're under grace? A real interesting subject. I think you'll find this uh, it's very interesting indeed, but we will have to do some work to understand this. All right, so what we're going to do in reading this, Paul basically takes a first century case. There's a, there's a situation that's not in our historical setting, so we have to try to understand uh, the notion of analogy that uh, they had a different situation. Get into, try to understand their situation, then we can roll it over into ours. Here's what he says. He says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Like he says, one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Okay, so the first question is, you know, why would somebody eat only vegetables in this setting? What is, he, what is going on here? All right, in the ancient world, um, they were polytheists. They were very religious people, way more so than what we're used to in America. Everybody was doing the religion. And one of the things they had in these uh, polytheistic cults was uh, temples where you could uh, offer animal sacrifice. And so huge numbers from the history that we have here, huge numbers of animals will be sacrificed in these temples. Now, the Greeks had a myth where uh, Hercules went up to Zeus and held two bags and said, which one do you want? And Zeus was so uh, fallible and not infinite and not omniscient that he picked the one on the right when he opened it up. That had all the fat and the bones and, and the useless the skin of the animal. The other bag was full of the meat. And so, and the guts too were in that one. So, as a result, from then on, the God's portion was the fat, the, the bones, and the, and the skin. And the people get to keep the meat. And of course, uh, Zeus was all PO'd about this. Well, uh, that's the way it worked. Usually, when you went in and offered one of these sacrifices... Uh, you just you just basically did away with the parts you didn't want anyway, and the meat, uh, the offer got to keep the meat. All those part of it had to be given to the priests. That was their fee for offering sacrifices at these temples. Now, of course, the priests wound up with more meat than than they needed for personal use, and so what they would do is is take the rest down to the market, sell it. Or some of these temples even set up actual uh, restaurants adjoining the temple itself, where you where you know you could go in and uh, and uh, be served uh, dinner there. You have a hamburger that was based on uh, sacrificial meat. Anytime you went into the market and bought meat, the chances were excellent that this meat had previously been dedicated to a god. People just did that, and there was no way to know. Well, the Jewish believers that had been scattered over the Roman Empire, and of which there were thousands in the city of Rome, were very nervous about contamination with idols. And so they, would, uh, they, they went back to an example in the book of Daniel, where Daniel and his friends were in an idol-worshiping culture, and they just decided we're not going to eat any of this meat because it's all been de- de- you know, devoted, dedicated to a god, a false god. And so they would not eat it. And the, a lot of the Jews in the time, this first century, imitated that and said we're not going to eat any of this meat because that would implicate us in the worship of idols. And so we'll just be ve- vegetarians. So they're vegetarians, not out of any concern that it's mean to kill animals, not out of any concern for health, but strictly because of moral contamination with idol worship. Now, the question then becomes, why does Paul say that their faith is weak uh, for taking this stand? Well, it, it should be clear that they lack the confidence in the grace of God. Whether we eat meat... Uh, that's been dedicated to an idol or not. What effect is that really going to have on our lives? 
This mentality that we have to avoid that at all costs is uh, uh, suggestive, you know, of uh, worry about uh, about moral contamination. You know, theologically, they're in the wrong here. They're they're completely mistaken. We see in a parallel passage that I'm going to refer to several times tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the same issue was coming up in Corinth. And he says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, he says, we know there is no such thing as an idol in the world. There is no God but one. He says, these idols that people worship are not even real. There's no such thing as Zeus. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, yet for us there's but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, so, you know, that's the truth is there's only one God. So whatever these other things are, you know, that people make up and uh, they were constantly creating new religions, they're not real, so it's not dangerous. I mean, what's it really going to do to you? There's your theology, okay? There's the facts. And yet, you know, some people basically were not comprehending that. They were probably confused on that point. That seems to be the, that seems to be the case here. And they were still worried about, about uh, having something to do with idols. And that even secondary content, even though they're not going, it'd be one thing if they were going in to, to a worship service for an idol god. I mean, that, that clearly would be implicate involvement in idol, in idol worship. But just eating meat that happened to have earlier been, uh, you know, blessed by a, an idol priest, that's not going to do anything to you. It's a secondary contact. On the other hand, he points out, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. The man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. So there's people in the Roman group there, Gentiles, probably are like, who cares about that? They're ready to eat the meat. It's probably the more restrictive Jews who are saying, dude, you shouldn't even be eating that. And, so they're, and it's, it's becoming a problem in the group. He says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, because the Lord's able to make him stand. One man, he says, considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own. Oh, okay, so considering one day more sacred than another. Well, that's probably the same crowd. That's probably the Jewish guys. Because they have the holy days, right? Sabbath day and festivals and so forth. So they would keep the Sabbath. They were still keeping the Sabbath, probably. And... You know, again, theologically, as far as what is actually true, they were in the wrong. We find, for instance, uh, Paul teaching in Colossians 2.16. He says, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. He says all these things are just shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ is the reality. So this is the whole circle of truth we studied when we were in the book of Hebrews, right? Is that all this Old Testament uh, ritualism was just set up to teach. They were shadows, he says. They were so, so like the shadow of my hand, you know. Is You could just study the shadow and say, well, it looks like it's got five things on it, whatever it is. You know, you could, t- you could determine things about what my hand was just based on shadow there. But then, you know, it would be pretty vague. Whereas now you got the, re- if you had the real thing, that's not vague at all. Now you see exactly what it is, right? And so that's analogous to what we have here with Christ. Now that Christ has come, all these symbols and stuff are all fulfilled. We don't need that stuff anymore. And so he says, don't let people judge you just because you're not willing to celebrate the Sabbath. Because that, that's old school. That's not, with, that's obsolete. So here are these guys in Rome. Apparently they haven't got this part. They they haven't comprehended this part. They're mixed up. They're wrong. But uh, they're they're continuing to to celebrate it. And they feel like kind of scandalized that some people are not. 